Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where a monolith is a movie screen, and the film playing on it may just be what you see when you look outside. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Our guest this time around is Alan Abadessa. Alan is one of the minds behind thesyncbook.com, a multimedia web platform dedicated to nurturing and exploring the art of synchronicity. If you've ran in these circles online long enough, you've surely come across their books or videos or podcasts. And Alan is here to talk about one of the Sync Book's latest projects, a docu-series he's producing called Hindsight 2020, the first episode of which is online now and forms the basis of the conversation you're about to hear. It's called 9-11 Spider-Verse, and it explores a cinematic world where 9-11 conspiracy theories are just the tip of the iceberg. Alan and I are going to spider out and spiral out from 9-11 and explore the legacies of the loose change and zeitgeist films, as well as the synchromystic subculture and post-postmodern artistic movement these films may have spawned. One note on the chat from a sound quality perspective, Alan's computer was out of commission, so we had to record via phone. Plus, we just recorded this on Monday afternoon, September 9th, and I wanted to turn this around quickly because of the subject matter, so I did not edit nearly as much in post-production as I normally do. So this one sounds a lot more like a raw episode, if you've heard some of those. So please excuse any ums, uhs, uh, longer than usual pauses, or any annoying mouth noises, breath noises, you know, things like that. I'm sure there are many of them. If you can get past those things, though, this is one conspiratating chat. Enjoy. Alan Abadessa, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate your interest and your time. Oh, I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you so much for having me on. No problem, man. No problem. You know, you uh, you reached out not long ago, actually, with a, a link to a video that we're going to get into here in a moment. But before we do, we need to cover off on a couple things, uh, namely you and your involvement with the sync book. Uh, but I think the best place to start, actually, is with that word sync, you know, short for synchronicity. I think we should maybe from your perspective define what a sync is because it can sometimes be a confusing and maybe even convoluted term to try to understand. So how do you define that word? <laughs> I've spent um, a going going on a decade now trying to make artwork that defines it. <laughs> so it's definitely a convoluted one. Um, but I think the easiest way to say it is meaningful coincidence. Um, and the, the emphasis on the word meaningful, something that uh, a correlation, um, a, a, you know, co coinciding of events in which they are meaningful. Uh, you know, I think the word coincidence, I don't know if you're a Robert Anton Wilson fan, but, you know, his sort of uh, idea of coincidence as being a dismissal of anything spiritual. Um, this instead is a recognition of two things coinciding and then finding that meaning. And we can come up with a million examples, which I'm sure we're going to discuss a bunch of those. But, uh, you know, it used to be you'd give the example of, hey, you're thinking of a friend that you haven't seen in 10 years. And then suddenly you get a phone call from the guy. And it's like, wow, OK, that's a that's a really meaningful coincidence. Now, every day, someone posts something like, wow, I was thinking about haagen ice cream. Facebook sent me a targeted ad. And now we're in a really strange territory where is that a synchronicity or is this, you know, <laughs> this really um, the evidence of a surveillance state? And that's where these sort of conspiracy and synchronicity somewhat unfortunately continue to overlap for me in these worlds because there's trying to discern what is a meaningful coincidence and what is an intentional action um, sometimes it's difficult to do. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I don't envy those who try to do it because like you said, it, or I guess like we both said, it can get a little convoluted at times as to what it actually is. And of course, what it means to you and your life and the big picture here. But I do want to talk about you. I, I love talking to people about themselves and, you know, kind of how they got into what they got into. So I'd like you to tell us just a bit about yourself and how you did come to be interested in the topic of synchronicity. Sure. Um, well, this video series that uh, you've seen the first episode of, this is kind of um, an exploration of my personal journey as well as a it's, it's a way for me to process my personal journey 
as well as uh, taking some of these things and just weighing them across a society at large and kind of seeing what is what is universal in that experience. Um, for myself, I'm, I was born and raised in New York. Um, when 9-11 happened, I feel like the, you know, the first day or two, it really didn't mean anything to me. It didn't register as something overly significant. Um, and sort of watching the reactions of people and, you know, the sort of propaganda at the time made me feel this idea that I was supposed, I was, it, it was that it was going over my head. What was I missing? Um, and I think I've spent a lot of time then processing that experience. Um, it's why I started with 9-11. I think that was very much an introduction for me and for many people of our generation into conspiracy, to the world of conspiracy and the wider realm of all the mysteries that we, you and I both have both covered for many years. Um, there's just one other slight little detail I would uh, preface that with is as a kid, so I'm, I'm born 1980, I'm almost 40 years old now, but uh, as a kid, I had a fascination with the idea of the JFK assassination and not like going into the details of it, more looking at the adults in my world and whenever it would come on, you know, a TV show or rant, you know, the, the occasional coming up at a conversation, it was always incredibly fascinating to me to see how adults in my world talked about that experience with this sort of shrugging, yeah, it was probably a conspiracy. What are you going to do about it? And I, that is, I think, the thing that I most wanted to understand, the psychological experience of how could, if you're telling me that everybody knew that, you know, there was some government conspiracy to kill the president and like life just went on and I couldn't fathom, I just couldn't fathom it. And I sort of really wanted to understand it. And in a weird way, this 9-11 experience and the almost, what is this, 18 years that have uh, come since, have really shown me what that experience is like to watch the people in the world um, see this experience. Some have questions, some eat up the propaganda, some whatever, but to watch as life just sort of had to go on, even with a truth movement or whatever you wanna call it, to see how time just goes on and things have a way of uh, to be clear, I'm not trying to be blasé. I'm not trying to help sweep it under the rug, obviously, but to say that uh, I now have a firsthand experience of it. I don't know if I understand it any better. I'm still trying to wrap my head around how we, as a society, deal with these events. Um, but I, I constantly think of that correlation that I kind of asked to understand it as a child and now as an adult. I very much have my own version of it that I've lived through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think 9-11 is kind of a, a gateway drug, you know, in many ways to the, a lot of different worlds, not just, you know, this conspiracy subculture, but I mean, there's, I get, you know, ties to the, the synchro mystic subculture that, that we'll talk more about too. And, you know, I guess you could look at it as an occult ritual on some level. So you could, you bring that into the picture then. And yeah, it's a really weird, um, you know, sort of uh, event to process on many levels, but I think I think the most compelling level is just geopolitically, which we can talk more about too later. So, um, but you know, I mentioned the Sync Book and your involvement with them up front, and I was just curious. You know, that's a, a media company that uh, a lot of people in the audience are probably familiar with it on some level, and I would just wanted to detail, you know, what it is you guys actually do there because this project that we're going to talk about is associated with that. So, you know, for the folks who don't know what the Sync book is, tell us a bit about, you know, the history of the project and the intention of it and your involvement with it. Sure. So, um, kind of, you know, uh, I have this experience of being involved in a conspiracy sort of subculture and truth movement, watching that evolve. For those of you who've seen the video already, I talk about how out of this experience comes 
these other questions and we've all seen you know the, the most basic examples would be like your simpsons 9 11 magazine cover and stuff like that and you know you know again depending how old the audience is like hey seeing these things pop up whether they be in uh, forums or on blogs or in little youtube videos and things like that and watching this sort of develop and at some point i came along uh, to this synchromistic culture and this was something um a term coined by a guy jake katza and he it was basically a combination of mysticism and synchronicity and uh, he has a very specific focus on media and the first time i came along that it was still pretty much more in my conspiracy realm and i remember the first time i saw one of his videos i was like i don't, I don't get what this dude's even trying to say here and i think it was like nine months later i ended up watching the same video again i didn't realize it was the same video until halfway through but in just in those nine months my way of thinking about things had changed now suddenly this video made perfect sense to me and i reached out to these guys i started following their blogs um i became uh friends with and sort of doing writing myself and sort of uh became very much involved in that subculture and i want to say it was um, somewhere in 2010 slash 2011, um, after a series of weird mystical experiences that maybe we'll talk about or, or not, um, things got really weird for me in 2010 and I was like, okay, these are the only people that I felt like I really trusted to have any sense of what was going on at that point. Um, and, and I say that as contemporaries, but also as people I looked up to. And uh, I proposed, hey, we're all doing blog posts regularly. What if we all took the time to write a short essay and maybe try to define synchronicity or give some great examples of it? Or let's explore this. Everyone write an essay and we'll put together an anthology. And that was the first sync book, which was released uh, on 9 11 in 2011. So this will be the eight year anniversary of the sync book. And at first, it was just that it was a book. Um, the book did surprisingly well. It sold a lot of copies, uh, got me a ton of you know, podcast interviews, radio interviews, and it changed my life in many ways. And it just sort of ballooned into this thing that I don't, <laughs> it's always a question for me how much control I had over that situation, but it definitely ballooned into a thing where what was meant to be a one-off project became the next most, uh, you know, seven, eight years of my life, full-time job. Um, at some point we started, uh, Douglas Bowles and Will Morgan started a podcast called 42 Minutes. I had been talking to them for a few months and I knew they were starting a podcast. We're like, well, what if we, we have this website, which all it had on it in the beginning was, here's a link to buy our book. And, there's a few interviews that some of the authors have done. And what if we did a podcast coming out of this website? And oh, what if we did another, someone else wanted to write a book? What if we did another book like that? What if we, et cetera, et cetera. And this thing kind of just kept growing. So it was at some point we had, oh, I don't know, eight books that we've released through Sync Book Press, uh, a series of podcasts um, uh, we had, uh, Guys like Marty Weeds and Frater X join us at some point down the road. Um, the thing just continued to grow and evolve, and it is a exploration at this point. I think of it as a bunch of interchanging people over the years coming in to both define what synchronicity is, explore all these side topics within it, and just. Um, kind of exploring this intersection of media, synchronicity, all these related topics in various forms, whether those be videos, podcasts, uh, articles, publications, books. We've done a little bit of everything over the years. Yeah, you guys certainly have. I mean, I've listened to several of the podcasts you guys have put out. Uh, you mentioned 42 Minutes, uh, Always Record, Pentimental, just to name a few of the titles I've had on my podcatcher at one point or another. Uh, but we're here because of this recent docu-series, which you've referenced, that you guys have started uh, called Hindsight 2020. 
we'll get into the first installment in that in just a moment. But in your email to me, uh, when you sent the link over, you described the docu-series as something that, quote, explores the intersection of philosophical movements, art movements, and political movements that ripple out of the 9-11 event, end quote. So, you know, Alan, let's set the big picture stage here and talk about these movements just a little bit. How would you characterize these three specific movements that you referenced, uh, philosophical, art, and political, in the wake of 9-11? I think the philosophical was, a lot of that was subconscious. I think that was particularly as Americans and, and certainly, you know, Europeans after probably like 2007, uh, the 777 bombing. Um, and all the ramifications of the global war on terror and all the countries that have been invaded, certainly it was a global experience, some of those being different. If you're in a country that's being invaded is certainly different than being an American citizen, being told we have to do this. Uh, but to say, there's no one size fits all philosophical trajectory, but to say this event as it changes the global landscape, the geopolitical landscape, we as people who don't get to make these decisions, we have to wrestle with that. It means we go out and protest or we wave our flags at Fox News and say, hell yeah, go get them. Or, you know, with all the people who joined the military and people who did a, a, any number of things, uh, it's sort of cliche to say 9-11 changed everything. I also don't think it's fair to say that 9-11 changed everything. If you look at uh, the way we, so this is going to kind of go into art movements and whatnot, but just talking about the way we measure time, we usually do that where we say, oh, this is the atomic age. Well, what is that defined by? It's not just the splitting of the atom, but all the technologies that are sort of around that. Uh, we can talk about the information age. We can talk, talk about the the industrial revolution, all these things. And usually there is a moment that kind of, whether or not it triggered this change, it's certainly indicative of the change. And that's how I feel about 9-11, where even if it's 100% straight up conspiracy, Project New American Century, and a bunch of neocons trying to make a new age in which they are the rulers, um, Looking around, they they have been fairly successful in doing that, unfortunately. But this idea of a new American century, this idea of a, a of a turning of a millennium, usually our different epochs and ways ways in which we measure time periods aren't so neat and tidy as being tied to like, oh, new century, it's totally different now. We have new technologies, we have whatever. Um, 9-11 happening at the turn of the millennium is indicative of so many things. Uh, and that's the, the way in which I want to explore the way in which the spiders out, uh, spider webs sort of come out of or all connect back to this 9-11 moment is you think about uh, the internet. So the internet you know, has been around since the 60s and 70s, but it wasn't in every home really till the 90s, right? Um, we could talk about cell phones people had cell phones but the first smartphone didn't come out till 2007 uh this idea of like everyone having cameras in their pocket wasn't a thing so here we're sort of still beholden to watching who, who was able to capture moments um there's i mean again i was living in new york on 9 11 i there's in this video there's a some grainy footage that I actually shot on that day. It's not great footage. Um, I didn't have a great camera. It's 2001. <laughs> I, you know, 20 years old. I didn't have uh, a, a, any great technology. Um, so we're looking at the way in which our technology is advancing as these things are happening. So suddenly, 9/11 to me represents was like a the old media, the, the last hurrah of old media. Yet, if you talk to people who have studied cable news, the idea of a 24-hour news cycle, maybe they would start that with uh, the O.J. Simpson car chase. Um, but certainly this is the thing that pushes cable news into a whole other direction. But it, to me, it's while it is changing that 
television landscape, it's certainly showing us how the internet is not quite there yet, but primed for a 9-11 truth. It's primed to be the event in which as this internet is coming into every home, we are able to explore it, analyze it moment by moment, frame by frame. So again, to say it all starts with 9-11 isn't really fair, but the fact that these again are coinciding, that doesn't mean it's just a coincidence, doesn't mean there's no conspiracy, I'm just saying this coinciding of technological advancements, geopolitical changes that of course are being done by politicians in reaction to uh, this event and so on, they're overlapping with each other. Uh, the same way that we might see in, in, in other ages. Uh, I, uh, I, I have talked about in the past things like the splitting of the atom and the discovery of LSD. This has been discussed by many academics that these two things are being developed at the same time. And this idea of an explosion outward and an explosion inward, um, one being uh, the symbol of, of war taken to its extreme, the other being taken to the extreme of a, a peace, love, hippie mindset, that they're both happening at the same time. So when we talk about the atomic age, we could just as easily be talking about the psychedelic age. Um, in much the same way, we talk about the internet age, we talk about this geopolitical 9-11 war on terror we could be talking about the same thing. And that's what I want to do with this series is show how these things are overlapping. So when you ask where, where are these, um, these different worlds, where are they now? Or what are those trajectories? I think they're on parallel or maybe splintering off tangents of each other, but they're all sort of happening roughly at the same time. And I think that's what I want to do is show both where they intersect, where they overlap, and also where they differ from each other. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. And let's step back and just, you know, tell people a little bit about the video in title. It's called 9-11 Spider-Verse. It's the first installment of this Hindsight 2020 docuseries that we mentioned. You guys put it online at the end of August. It's only 20 minutes long, so it's actually a pretty quick video to digest. But that is a thought-provoking title, you know, 9-11 Spider-Verse, and you kind of touched on it there in your explanation, but let's just dissect that a little more and do that through, like, exploring the premise of the actual video itself, you know? What does that phrase, 9-11 Spider-Verse, actually refer to here? So the Spider-Verse, uh, I don't use this phrasing in the video at all, but um, I'm sure many people in your audience are familiar with the term Indra's Net. Um, and I feel like that is the esoteric or philosophical version of what we're talking about, this idea of everything being connected in this essentially spider web of connections and coincidences. And, um, yet, when we look at any of our conspiracy imagery, I use the It's Always Sunny meme. I'll be honest, I've uh, never really watched the show, but We've all seen that meme of the guy standing in front of the red lines connecting. I also uh, use a clip from uh, what is a beautiful mind. This guy has a whole, you know, the whole wall covered in little clippings. And it's, it's, it's shown almost as this level of insanity of look at this guy trying to document the way in which all these things are connected. But again, when we turn to our mystical and spiritual imagery, we have the exact same imagery. And that is taken as this, oh, this is an enlightened perspective. And the guy, the conspiracy guy is like, wow, that dude is crazy here. That dude is trying so hard to wrestle with these connections. Um, the idea that we maybe are making connections that don't actually relate to one another. Uh, we've all, I think, probably experienced this when we're talking about conspiratorial uh, perspectives someone who just looks at you, whether that's some cognitive dissonance or whatever their rejection might be. Um, and then we could just talk about even like things, uh, I just after I put out this video series, I was talking to a friend and his Skype icon was, uh, you ever see that Alex Gray painting where he's got what looks like, 
you know, and he's got like 9-11 in there. And it's literally a depiction of Indra's net. And I was like, oh, I've forgotten all about this. It's literally a spider web that has 9-11 in it. Uh, we have the Spider-Man movie trailer, which was uh, showing a Spider-Man catching this helicopter between the Twin Towers. And they had to pull that commercial because this commercial came out just before 9-11. And suddenly, whoa, having a helicopter fly at these buildings looks inappropriate. Uh, there's a few other Spider-Man examples, um, but to say like this sort of repetitive imagery for me was the perfect example. Uh, in addition to, I don't know if you've seen this movie that came out last year, uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. No, I haven't seen it yet. I've heard it's good though. It's, I'll be honest, man, I haven't, I haven't seen a, like a, any comic book movie in years. I don't particularly care for uh, that, but I did see this Spider-Verse because I love animation and I had heard wonderful things about the art stylings of it. And I was blown away by how good this movie is. Visually, the, the sound design, like, like I can talk for an hour about the sound design of that movie, incredible production. But just to say, here's this movie that is suddenly bringing to everyone's attention this idea of like parallel universes. And uh, that's that's basically like all the different Spider-Mans from different alternate realities and so on. And all these things sort of combined for me to think that there was a really nice um, play on words and a combination of concepts that could be described with this Spider-Verse idea of that. Both it's the spider web of the conspiracy, it's the spider web of the mystical Indra's net concept and the sort of uh, overlapping parallel alternate dimensions that come through this movie. So all of those things sort of overlapped. Yeah, and oddly enough, when you watch your video on YouTube, uh, this 9-11 Spider-Verse, there is a, an ad for that movie, that Spider-Man movie to, I guess, rent or buy through YouTube there. So... Uh, it's good, good marketing on their part, I guess, but whatever. So I think they probably, <laughs> yeah. So, and that's funny. I mean, I, I knew going into this that no matter what I did, you know, this is another way we have to look at it. Like, how do you make artwork now knowing that literally the way in which it's going to be absorbed into our online universe is someone else is going to slap something else on top of it? I honestly, what I was more concerned with was, uh, I feel like they, I've heard that YouTube has suspended this um, policy, I guess it would be the word to use, that they had an algorithm that was looking for videos with 9-11 imagery and putting all these sort of warnings about conspiracy. This was their way of preventing a proliferation of conspiracy theories on their internet, was that YouTube said, we are going to try and find videos that have conspiracy content and put warnings on them and put links to it's and which of the greatest source of all wikipedia it's like literally oh you're watching a conspiracy video here's a link to 9-11 on wikipedia that'll <laughs> yeah. solve all that'll answer all your questions um but that was their solution right so it's literally i knew they were going to add something to it and just living in a world where that awareness is kind of speaks to what I was talking about in this process of like, how do we separate out all these bits of media and the way in which we're having this multi-dimensional experience to see a pop-up ad for Spider-Man or see a pop-up ad for the mainstream 9-11 conspiracy, you know, conspiracy story, whatever it might be to recognize that all our media at this point is multi-dimensional, is multi-layered, is non-linear due to the way in which we're consuming it. Um, that's something we couldn't have predicted 20 years ago. And yet, when we look back at all the imagery from 20 years ago, it's all right there. It's, it's, it's in that moment. And that's why I think this is also indicative of an art movement, because it's how do we now make media? How do we create artwork for this world, for this changing world and adapting to it? 
Well, I've been interested in that too. And to be honest, it's kind of how I approach the podcast here where, you know, people don't know this unless I tell them and I hate to say it, but you know, whatever. But there is a lot of elements of, I guess what you would say is fictional storytelling and what I do here. And I think when you combine those elements or, or that, that narr- or sorry, those narrative techniques perhaps with what people might perceive as real world events or whatever they would, you know, however they construct their reality, whatever they consider real to them, when you combine like fact and fiction almost, I think that is where we're at right now is you're not really sure what's real and what's not, but you know that it's being blended together to present you this narrative or this experience right now. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, look at, uh, uh, you know, he's not the great, he's not the greatest example of how to, how to present yourself, but perfect example of this being on the main stage, guys like Alex Jones, where he has since, said hey this is an enter for entertainment purposes only i am a i'm an entertainer and of that we, we should all accept that there's some fiction in its presentation right um which is hilarious that this the things that we are that we think of as the truth movement are by definition filled with fictions and even in making this video or like i said doing podcast whatever you realize and i don't mean this as an to as a, to be an apologist for alex jones but to say like you have to do that to a certain extent there's in this video there's probably about two sentences in this video that, like i straight up don't agree with but i worded them in such a way that i thought it would be i don't know more fun like there's a thing there's a line where i say wikipedia removed this thing about coup party music this this album cover uh that was at the printer on 9 11 showing a picture of the world trade center exploding it's one of my perfect you know beautiful example of 9 11 synchronicity um and i i make this comment about why did wikipedia remove it as if it was a conspiracy well wikipedia could be changed tomorrow and they someone put it back you know it's like i know it's not a conspiracy to hide that information but it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek, like, hey, if we're going to do this, if we're going to play this game, let's do it, right? Like, um, let's let's do some winking and nodding and have some fun with it. Uh, and yet, going back to an Alex Jones example, you see that there are real-world ramifications for taking that to another extreme. Um, so guys in our position, in our line of work are in a really weird and sometimes dangerous territory of dancing around that line between fact and fiction. Uh, and I think it's, we really need to acknowledge that. Well, I just did, and I have no problem dancing around that line. I think it's pretty fascinating to not only operate in that space, but also observe it from the outside too, you know, because once I got into this project, I started to realize like man it was kind of kind of necessary to straddle that line on some level because you know we are all now content creators whether we're doing podcasts or not right and mm-hmm. that's what social media is for I think you know like you have become part of the narrative and your persona online you know every tweet or post wherever you you know may be interacting with people I mean that's you constructing a story through media, whether you, you know, want to or not, or whether you realize it or not. I think like once I step back and started to see it that way, I'm like, okay, well, this podcast is now part of the zeitgeist, if you will, this new media zeitgeist, however you want to define that. But yeah, I just think, man, it was necessary for me, I think, to at least look at myself as almost like a performer on some level, like an entertainer and not a podcast host. And I hate that, but it's also, like you said, sort of necessary to embody that like Alex Jones does, you know? So I want to get back into the video um, before we get too far away from it and just talk about, you know, some of the actual content of the video because uh, you started by talking about Loose Change, you know, the infamous 9-11 conspiracy video uh, that was released in 2005. And you highlight an article uh, by Vanity Fair that came out one year after Loose Change, and the article stated that 
you know, this might just be the first internet blockbuster, which in hindsight is quite an endorsement for a full-fledged 9-11 conspiracy video. And because, you know, this video went viral before the term viral went viral, if that makes sense. And Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Now, as you state in the video, there's there's no might be about this statement from Vanity Fair. Loose Change absolutely is the first internet blockbuster. And I want to talk about the legacy of this series of films because you said something in the video that I thought was apropos. You said, quote, we can safely say that our online cultural experience began with an opening salvo of explosive data points, rapid fire editing, and a controlled demolition of the status quo all neatly wrapped in a whodunit ripped from the headlines, end quote. And wow, I love that. But we have to pick that apart now because, you know, we're about, I guess, 15 years or so removed from the first Loose Change video coming online. And as we look back on it, Alan, and the other films in the series that followed, I think we could look at its legacy in two ways. And I want to start with the first way, obviously, its effect on greater American culture, not just the conspiracy subculture, although who knows, they may be one and the same nowadays. But from your perspective, you know, what is the cultural legacy of Loose Change? Uh, I would agree 100% that that legacy is twofold. Because in one way, and, and for sure there were conspiracy videos before it, but none that had this level of success, right? This was the thing that broke into mainstream awareness. Um, so it does create a conspiracy genre of filmmaking. It sort of lays the, again, the movie is almost like an art history. It defines some of the parameters for how, how we present this information. Um, you know, what, what does that look like? What does it sound like? The way we would talk about, a, oh, I don't know, you know, classic rock or hip hop or like all the different ways you can break down artistry and say, well, this sounds like this, it's from this time. So in, in a lot of ways, it's a creating and defining the conspiracy video genre, but totally removed from that, totally removed from that. Just you're in the most square, you know, suit and tie, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, mid, middle of America, whatever you, whatever uh, terminology or imagery you want to use, just like completely removed anything uh, conspiratorial or, or fringe or any which way, you know, you're a guy curating the Museum of Modern Art. You have to recognize that this is the first blockbuster created by the internet. And to ask the question, what does that mean for our society and for the, the groundwork that lays for every piece of media that comes after it in this technological age is, is essentially what I want to explore, but that's a huge implication, right? Um, that, that, that is totally unavoidable for anybody who probably want to avoid that. I mean, you know, you and I are very comfortable talking about conspiracies and weird stuff. That's that's fine. The guy who's running the Museum of Modern Art, probably not so much. How how does he wrestle with that? How 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 does anyone try and make sense of that fact? Um, and in that in that sense, that legacy, I think in one respect, we're still close enough to it that we can see that it's treated as a little bit of like a laughing experience. When I talk to people outside of my internet corner of people that I'm comfortable speaking to, and I, I work in, as a bartender, I'm just talking to people all the time uh, out in the world, most people view this stuff either as weird thing to stay away from or almost a kind of joke. And yet you can see in their reactions, it's a self-defense mechanism because of facts like this. Because it's so ubiquitous at this point, that cognitive dissonance and just the, the self-defense mechanisms have to kick in for people to process it. Because we're still, even if we're 15 years out from loose change, and I think it's long enough out that I'm willing to make this series and say, hey, there are things that are only 
uh, only become clear with enough time and context behind them. And yet, the answer to that question, I think, still needs more time in the sense of how is society going to process that legacy? I think right now we're still in the stage of a sort of denial. We're trying to look at it, and I'm, and I, I'm saying we is a very broad set because I certainly don't feel this way, but I think society in, in general at the moment looks at that legacy at the moment as still that sort of laugh it off. And yet we have those famous uh, quotes of like the stages of media recognition. Oh, at first it's a joke. At some point, you know, you argue against it. At some point you just sort of accept it. And in a way, I think it'll be like the legacy of a JFK, going back to something I said earlier, where you go out and it's far enough and it's just like, yeah, prob probably, probably it was a conspiracy. <laughs> you know, like, what, what, do you, what do you do with that? Uh, but then from a media perspective, from an art perspective, the thing that I find so fascinating, the way the sort of punchline that I end this uh, particular episode of Hindsight 2020 with is that even Loose Change itself was written first as a fictitious piece. The guy, uh, Dylan Avery, was writing a story about him and his friends discovering, you know, just, hey, we'll be cool with, like, me and my friends uh, uncover, you know, we're James Bond Jr. or something, and we uncover this government conspiracy and make a story out of that. And he started doing research into nylon conspiracy theories just to make his plot more believable. You know, if I'm going to talk about nylon conspiracies, I guess I should be familiar enough with them. So he starts to research this stuff, and suddenly they're like, oh, this is a real thing. This is a genuine conspiracy that I now believe it's no longer uh, a joke for these guys. It's now suddenly deadly serious, and suddenly it consumes them. It becomes a passion for them of we have to share this information with everyone else. And they're movie, which was also to be called Loose Change, changes from a work of fiction into a work of truth movement media. Oh, you know, like a light switch. It just flips from being one to the other. And in that sense, I think hopefully given enough time, that could be its legacy. Um, as far as just a piece of propaganda, and I mean that in the most uh, unloaded way of just like it's the dispersal of information or perspective um, so if we want to look for it in that way but hopefully everyone at some point is like yes we agree but would that be too far out to really do much about it uh, um, <laughs> as far as a, an art movement piece that's where I feel like we can really sink our teeth in now because this idea that it's both fact, both fiction, that it's exploring a nonlinear spider web narrative, that it's the beginning of the internet age, that it's tied into real world events, that it comes out of fiction, that it's all these things at once. This is what I think it's true artistic mainstream legacy will be. Uh, if we look at like postmodernism, this idea we see that like at some point, there's like the whole idea of like um, man rebels against like the kings and then at some point man uh, is raging against the gods and at some point in postmodernism we have this turn towards the uh, protagonist rebelling against the writer of the story, the, the modern god in this work of fiction. And then we are now in a stage and there are many authors who explore this idea of now we are writing our own story so you're rebelling against the writer of your story oh wait you are the writer of your own story as you said we're all content creators now how do you wrestle with this idea and it ultimately comes down to these very old old ideas both indra's net or um these zen ideas you know who is the master who makes the grass green at the end of the day if you were both the writer and struggling protagonist of your own story you need to get your act together, you know? So this realization of self that comes out of this type of artwork would be my hopeful, my, on the days that I'm feeling very optimistic, that, that would be my, my hopeful 
forecast for the way this media progresses. Yeah, and I mean, you describe Loose Change in the video as the first video to successfully translate this spiderweb narrative and that it was an all too real harbinger of some sort of post postmodern art movement, which you were just talking about. And, you know, one, one line from the doc, too, uh, and the loose change impact on culture that I really liked, too, was that you talked about, you know, people beginning to reject traditional storytelling in their consumption of media. That's another thought provoking line of narration there from you. And I, I don't know if we need to talk more about that, but if you want, you know, what do you mean by that? Just the fact that we're rejecting traditional storytelling in our consumption of media. What, what does that mean exactly? So I think that's saying the way in which people need their stories to be different. So again, you know, we can look at any of these sort of periods of cinema, of literature, any, anything like that, and we can see there are trends within them. And that idea of the consumption of media of saying, hey, you know, obviously we still have our BS Hollywood Schlock, like Fast and the Furious, 97, whatever, people are still looking for explosions. And in that sense, they have not rejected Hollywood garbage um, completely yet. But this idea that in that moment, when they are faced with a real world event, when they're able to recognize the world changing around them, which I think is something as we take this a little further out, I think has been kind of buried back in the sand a little bit. Um, the idea that people were fully aware, their eyes were open into the fact that the world was changing around them. The old stories just wouldn't cut it. And by that, I mean, you know, even something as far as, uh, if let's say you're the most Fox News loving conservative guy who came out of 9-11 and you're like, yeah, let's go get them all or whatever. Uh, we could see shows like 24. Okay, do you remember that show? It was like a Fox counterterrorism yeah. strike yeah, yeah. force, right? Now, that first episode was pushed back because of 9 11, because it just showed a bomb exploding on an airplane. So there was a whole thing of like, do we show this or not? So, in a way, whether, and that's, you know, Fox, I don't use that example in the video because to me, it's questionable for me if that's a synchronicity or or not. Um, but so here we have a piece of media that has this sort of synchronicity element of, oh, it was about to come out and, and it was too close to reality, so we had to wait. It was just too real. This fiction was suddenly too real or predictive of a real world event. And then you take that a few more episodes out and Somebody they're like, screw it, let's embrace it. And they're putting waterboarding into their show. And they are bringing this real world story into their fiction. Um, so suddenly, since this boundary has been dissolved a little bit between fact and fiction, that's what I mean. People just, they couldn't handle like just a fictional narrative. They needed or they craved this something that explored that dissolved boundary um and again that's to take even from the perspective of as low 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 on the ranking of, of artistry as we could probably get some fox waterboarding propaganda really low on my list of what i'd consider art and yet even that shows that same idea yeah do you know what this reminds me of it reminds me of addictive behaviors, people who have addictions, because when you're addicted to something, it doesn't matter what it is, you gradually build up tolerance to that substance and you just need more and more of it, or you need different varieties of it. And I think that we have this addiction to media, to consuming everything that we get, can, can get our hands on, I guess. And this is no different, you know, Consuming media is no different than consuming food or drugs or sex or whatever it is that you might build up a tolerance to on some level. And you just need different types of it, different varieties of it. You know, you need to sample here and there like, oh, well, here's some grade A media cush here. But here's some low level media cush over here. Right. And 
it's just kind of like that is i don't know to me it's obvious to look at it that way but i don't know if you've ever thought of it that way sure um so I, you know, since a lot of my work and not just my work but the that sync book and synchronistic world in which i swam for so many years the people that i've worked with have been exploring uh all this stuff i, I love uh I have a friend, Jason Barrera, who did a blog post showing all these similarities between the movie The Rocketeer and Stanley Kubrick films, except that The Rocketeer came out first. And he's like, you know, this is considered really lowbrow art. And yet all the framing is the, is the same. All the sort of character arcs are the same. All this blah, blah, blah. It's like, how do you make that just? distinction between this guy is some brilliant auteur and this is some you know disney made for direct tv <laughs> you know release or something um that that line is definitely getting blurred and again going i think you give the perfect example of social media so you both from an addictive standpoint of how many people have talked to this idea of you scroll until you get some sort of endorphin kick and then you keep scrolling, you know, just looking for some sort of fix there. Um, that's such a state of our world right now. But again, it is, oh, here's some guy I went to junior high school with this reality. Um, maybe I can laugh at his misfortune or I'm doing better than him. And then on the other hand, oh, here's this, this is uh, everyone's news source. You tell people, where do you get your news? It's what we call the news feed on your Facebook. So how many people are just consuming whatever links their friends share or, or things like that. So this correlation between it is it's social, it's media, you're a content creator and you're also the audience. You get to vote. Um, I like this. I don't like this. This thing gets, you know, I'm helping make this viral or I am uh, they, what they call that cancel, right? Cancel culture or you can, you can help promote it or all these things where we're consumed into this media world, uh, both as creators and consumers, uh, you know, in one way, it's, it's a bit cancerous. It's a thing devouring itself. Um, and in another way, it's, again, I'm, I'm, when I want to think about it from terms of the absolute most esoteric standpoint, it's like, this is uh, an Ouroboros. This is this is the human history. This is Joseph Campbell's hero cycle. This is uh, going back to like the esoteric ideas of Wheel of Fortune, uh, how that was used in medieval literature. All these ideas we can see being expressed on an hourly basis, literally refreshing your page to get a new hit of it. You know, to shake a shaking it up you're 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 shuffling the tarot deck you're shaking your magic ink ball whatever you're doing you're constantly reshuffling reality around you in a small and sm smaller and smaller dosages um one of the one of the episodes i'm going to have to explore uh 2012 phenomenon and as i realize as i'm talking this sounds kind of like terence mckenna's time wave zero and that in itself has to be something that is addressed of what were those expectations? How did that change? But uh, how did that change people's expectations of what was going on with reality, as well as what were people's expectations going into it because of the 9 11 event, because of the, the change in reality that we're able to trace coming out of this event? And then I feel like 2012 is another sort of turning point in that. Um, not in a not in a literal Mayan calendar sense per se, but even from a, a weird sociological experiment way. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I think 2012 wasn't that. Yeah, I don't want to mention Sandy Hook, but I think that was a Sandy Hook event towards the end of that year too. So that was an interesting year for sure in terms of uh, synchro mystic. Uh, conspiracy theory stuff. <laughs> so I don't want to get into that one, though. But, you know, you uh, 
you transition at some point in the video from loose change you know the first the first internet blockbuster to the second internet blockbuster a film called zeitgeist which came out in 2007 i know a lot of folks know this film they've seen it they know what it's about and you called its title you know dead on the money because it i you know, i guess uh of what has come since then and when considering what the film is about it absolutely is a title that reflects you know the current american zeitgeist but i just want to talk about this film for a moment you know i want you to refresh our memory of it you know like what it's about and you know how it does play a role in our spider web narrative that we're weaving here sure well that's also another play on words right dead on the money it's um the the film so uh, Zeitgeist is a three part film. This is the original one. I'm not. I don't feel like the sequels rank as far as you know that that was its own sort of series and had its its success and it's, you know, there was a Zeitgeist movement that came out of that. But just talking from the most objective reality of like what can we say was an internet blockbuster? If if Loose Change was the first one. What is the thing again? I'm, I'm I'm at a bar and I was talking about this video uh, project a few months ago when I was kind of kicking up the ideas, and some guy I know who's not into any of this stuff, and I said some of Zeitgeist. He's like, "Oh, sure, sure, I've seen that." I'm like, "Cool, yeah, of course you have," because at that time everyone saw it. <laughs> um, so the the first part is um, talking about religion, and he does this by talk about uh, the basically a comparative mythology looking at the Jesus story of Christmas and the solar cycles and looking at other mythological figures that were either born on December 25th or that were mythological representations of the winter solstice and the intention I believe in that film was to say hey look religion is basically a sham I think it was meant to be like religion silly what i got out of it was it as someone who's interested in mythology and particularly comparative mythology was hey this is great that people are getting exposed to this um i think that's the i don't know if it was as, as successful as destroying religion as it was a kind of Tapping into, okay, uh, so I, I know this isn't directly answering your question or a little off topic, but to say, again, if we want to take the sort of trajectory, in like 2008, there was a film called Esoteric Agenda, I'm sure a lot of people have seen. Um, this is again sort of uh, expressing this turning point from the conspiracy of loose change into the symbolic uh, awareness. As you get all these Illuminati conspiracy theories, as you get all the the Freemason stuff, and everyone's like, "Oh, well, I, I, these are weird symbols, and you're looking at owls, and what does this all mean? What is this, what is this glowing eye?" And suddenly, everyone on the internet becomes a armchair expert in symbolic awareness of, of ancient symbols. And to me, that is really fascinating. So that's what I really think is fascinating. And Zeitgeist, I couldn't really address it in this one. But Zeitgeist is, a, is tapping into that but by showing this comparative mythology, even though his intention is to be like, oh, look, religion's silly. What he's doing is he's tapping into that interest in symbolism. And I think both tapping into and feeding into the next few years where that dominates the moment. Um, so again, I think like an unintended consequence. The second part of the film, uh, Zeitgeist, is uh, all about 9-11 conspiracies. And again, there were a, a million of those at the time, uh, you know, secrets in plain sight and stuff like that. Uh, like there was an Italian film called Zero. Uh, I thought that one was pretty well done. There was a, there was a lot of 9-11 documentaries at that time. Too, too many to list. There was a lot of 9-11 documentaries at the time. But Zeitgeist, his intention with that is to show that it's both indicative of the defining moment of this time, again, going back to the title of the film, Zeitgeist. Uh, it's like spirit of the age or um, the, the thought process, the, the ideologies. Of the... So it's uh, it's like almost like more, more literal translation, like time ghosts, right? But it's like 
uh, I, I love that because that makes you say like um, makes you think it conjures the imagery of this this moment in time this spirit that's trapped in time and all that's sort of uh, absorbed within that um, uh, but regardless 9-11 he's saying hey this is not only an event that is in, indicative of this time period because of the global ramifications and so on, uh, but also the breaking of the illusion. And that's, I think for him is more important and that goes to kind of what we're talking about of the way people's perceptions are changing. So he wants to break the illusion of religion. He wants to break the illusion of 9-11 propaganda. And then in the third part, he wants to break the illusion of monetary, the monetary world we live in, our financial institutions. So he talks about fa uh, fractional reserve banking, um, federal reserve, stuff like that, um, which, which is fascinating from a long-term long perspective to think about like that was, it's almost like a forgotten topic. I remember when that was something you heard every freaking day on the internet, someone talking about the federal reserve and now we're like, well, what what did Trump draw on today? Um, <laughs> yeah, craziness. But um, that you mentioned my the phrase in my thing of like dead on the money is again a sort of play on words of like it's what do we it's the dead and resurrected God it's the it's the 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 mass murder of all these people that we see on nine eleven and it's the um, this hijacking of people's wealth uh all sort of tied together and he he's using that as a almost like vignettes a three-part thing of let's break down the illusions that are trapping us right his his logo is this globe with a cage around it and i think his intention is to like hey let's free people from the these illusory concepts that are holding their minds and holding this planet captive and yet, what is, you know, in, in that, around the same time, we get Alex, uh, just to go back to Alex Jones for a second, he's promoting this idea of prison planet. Um, and I, I can't help but think of, again, both Indra's net from a positive perspective and the, the Gnostic ideas. I don't know how much time you've spent in that world, but like the Gnostic concepts of, essentially like a, a matrix or a, a, a prison planet, a, a, a construct in which to, to, to trap consciousness and spirituality. Um, the fact that all these things are, this terminology and this imagery is so prevalent at this time, whether you want to take it from the essentially paranoid perspective of like a Alex Jones, that's a, it's a prison, you know, they're, they're, they're imprisoning you to, Oh, there's a net in the sky of, of endless connections. And this is the gods, this is Indra's net. We see that imagery in the Zeitgeist logo. I just think it's fascinating that, again, only makes sense with enough context. This is why this film, Hindsight 2020, is to say, like, these are things that at the moment you couldn't really, everything's just happening. You know, who's ripping off who or who's inspired by who. And you sort of, when you can look back with enough distance and enough um, perspective, you can see that, again, this is just the imagery that dominates this time. Um, but the concepts, how, how one perceives them can change from person to person. One person's going to see it as a sort of paranoia, one sees it as a pronoia, um, and the truth probably lies somewhere in between those or, or has to include both of those to some extent. But regardless, the, the concepts are, are tied together seamlessly in all the media that dominates this moment in time. Absolutely. And speaking of the truth, you know, I got a question for you that it deals with a poll that you mentioned that came out in 2006. You mentioned this in the video that 42% of Americans believe the U.S. government and the 9-11 Commission covered up the official truth of 9-11. That was 2006, though, and I have to believe that if that 42% number was even accurate back then, that the percentage is higher now. 
And let's remember that Loose Change came out in 2005, so not much before this poll was conducted. But let's assume that that 42% back then is accurate or was accurate, and let's assume that it's also higher now. That's half the country or more calling bullshit on the official 9-11 narrative. And if you had to guess, is that number so high because of the influence of the internet and its, you know, sort of non-linear hyperlinked narrative that includes things like loose change and zeitgeist? Or is that number so high for other reasons that I can't come up with right now? Well, like you, I assume that number is probably not really that accurate. I, I just don't trust polling to be too accurate in itself. Uh, even though I, wa I want those numbers to be right, I, I don't know how much I feel that. But then again, is it because if Zeitgeist is essentially the number one movie in America, you know, if you polled, I don't know, but, well, if you polled the country about an Avengers movie tomorrow, probably, you know, more than half the country could comment on Avengers. Um, but if you ask them to talk about a movie from 15 years ago, how quick are they to still believe in it or have they forgotten it have they so to say i'm not sure i agree with your idea that that number is higher now i'm i'm afraid that i think that number is probably lower now both with a younger generation that man uh so i i uh, i used to be married to a woman who had like uh, younger sisters right and i remember one day i'm hanging out with them and they're playing pictionary with their friends and this is like well knee deep in this shit you know I like all this conspiracy stuff whatever and i see one of these kids draw a triangle with an eye in it and it's glowing and someone goes like illuminati and they're all laughing and he's like i don't know probably like eight-year-old kids maybe 12 I don't, I don't know um and i so i was like i'm sorry i have to interrupt you all i gotta ask like what do you think that means and they're like i don't know it's just like a funny meme and i'm like oh shit like I was for a minute, I'm like, cool, these kids get it. Like, you know, not that not that I'm a proponent of Illuminati conspiracy theory, but like, cool, that even to have that terminology in the mainstream to me would be like a pro probably a, a good thing, right? It's just like that we can have these mm, hopefully more intellectual conversations, um, or that this that this data is is not just restricted to this tiny quarter of the internet. Uh, that would have been a hopeful thing for me. And again, I, I don't, I'm not a proponent of some Illuminati conspiracy theory per se. Um, but when their, their answer to that, uh, and then I want to base this whole thing again, of like the Zogby poll from 2006 isn't accurate. My polling of five, nine-year-olds <laughs> is probably not particularly accurate either. But just to say, like, from my experience, I realized Man, how many people, again, the guy was like, yeah, I, I remember seeing Zeitgeist. He's not a conspiracy theorist. He's seen it. He's aware of these conspiracy theories. But he's not a conspiracy theorist. He's not going to go out and protest. He's not going to be like, oh, shit, um, you know, this guy who was res partially responsible for 9-11 just got hired into Donald Trump's cabinet. We should do something about that. They don't have, you know, that's, that's, it's kind of forgotten information. One again, one of the reasons that I wanted to incorporate into this video, I don't really want to rehash 20 year old conspiracies, but I think for the generation that's out right now that is living in a moment where we've kind of put this stuff back on the shelf a little bit, or that it's become kind of the, the joke meme culture, I feel like it wouldn't hurt to, like, hey, let's refresh your memories a little bit. A bit. Um, I also would just to say, and I'm just introducing new people. One of my intentions for this film, from even like a, I don't know, a magical or a just setting of intentions perspective, my one of my intentions with this film series is to literally like the old heads, the dudes who were actually willing to go out into the street and protest and who were, hey, let's do something about this. This is a real, this has a real consequences on our lives. Protesting the Patriot Act. Now we're buying, you know, I think if people were still into this 15 years later, if that number was higher, people probably wouldn't be buying Alexas to have in their home and 
security cameras made by you know government agencies to put in every room of their house uh that's the point which i'm not particularly optimistic um but i feel like if we can reignite some of the old fires and the people that took this stuff seriously and wanted to do something about it even if it's maybe a little too late you know it's going to be a lot harder for us to fight against a thing that's got 20 years of money and momentum behind it um but just to remember where where we stood why it was important for us to stop it it's it's easy to be like damn well everyone's putting a security camera in their house and you know government microphones in their house i guess there's not much i could do it's easy to throw up my arms but I feel like if we could say, do you remember, it wasn't that long ago that that very idea would have been preposterous. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can, maybe there's still a chance to do something. Um, I don't know if I'm convincing myself, but <laughs> <laughs> I damn yeah. sure want to try. I damn sure want to try. Uh, that's all we can really do is try, right? So, hey, we're going to end the free portion of the chat here. We're going to transition over to some bonus material for our Patreon audience now but before we do alan tell our free audience where they can watch the 9-11 spider-verse video and where they can keep up with you and your work as well absolutely uh, if you go to the syncbook.com that's t-h-e-s-y-n-c-b-o-o-k the syncbook.com um i actually have the video posted on the front page of the website at the moment uh I will be posting the full series when it's available at thesyncbook.com slash 2020. So it's an easy little URL to add there. Um, totally, you can keep up with it there. I would ask people to subscribe to us on YouTube. I, I, I worked pretty hard to make sure this video wouldn't get kicked off YouTube for copyright. So um, I've had a lot of trouble with that in the past. And it's actually on YouTube. So cool. I did it. I succeeded in what I was trying to do. So please subscribe there, um, but definitely check out the website. Man, I've got an archive on that website. You've got podcasts going back for years. It's all free. There was at some point I did do a paid version of the website. I have in the last year or two, I've taken all the paywall down, and you can really go back and listen to archives for, I mean, there's just so much material there. Uh, old podcasts, ton of videos. Uh, if anyone's interested in synchronicity and this sort of stuff, uh, all the topics that we've explored today, absolutely go dig deep and have fun with the archives. And then in the future, I will be, uh, my plan is to drop in actually year 2020 to drop the whole series, kind of like you, know, you could have a Netflix, you could have a whole season available at once. It's like, cool, I'll give a first episode out for free, and then the full series will drop as a whole whole chunk next year. Awesome. I will link uh, those links in the show notes for people who are interested uh, in digging into the sync book and this video specifically. So, dude, thanks so much for real. Hey, thank you. I really, this was a, a great, I know, I feel like um, this was just, this was great to actually talk to you where you, you totally got where I was going with this. And I, I appreciate uh, you meeting me on a very genuine level. I really, really appreciate that. No problem, man. It's the least I can do for you is take your work seriously and, you know, try to figure out what exactly the hell you're trying to say. So, cause I, I, I think, <laughs> I think if I made the same video, I'd be trying to say the same thing. So, uh, really enjoyed it. And I hope that you get some more views based on the chat here. So Alan, dude, take care of yourself, man. I will talk to you soon. You too. Thank you so much, man. Have a great day. And there you have it. My thanks again to Alan Abadessa. Please do click on through to the 9-11 Spider-Verse video that's linked in the show notes. Quite an entertaining 20 minutes there. You won't be disappointed. You know, I said a lot during the chat, but I wanted to reiterate one thing that I think I actually may have said in the Patreon version of it. I wanted to reiterate that it does seem like we went from linear storytelling in traditional media to non-linear storytelling in this new media environment. And that new media environment includes the internet, obviously, with all of its hyperlinks, which make up this spiderweb narrative or this spider-verse, but new media also includes you and me. We're no longer passive spectators in media. 
I don't know if this connects back somehow to 9-11 conspiracies or synchronicities. I don't know if there's any connection there, other than, you know, maybe 9-11 made this non-linear new media narrative possible somehow by emotionally sucking us into it, erasing what we perceived as a, as a fourth wall between us and the spectacle, if you're familiar with that term in the uh, society of the spectacle context. And also this blurring of genres in our storytelling, blurring the lines of fiction and nonfiction, reminds me of something Gordon White said when I first chatted with him back in episode 66. He said essentially that there's just story, and that the terms fiction and nonfiction are book publishing marketing terms. They didn't exist before. So remember that as you weave your way through the Spider-Verse here. Everything is real and nothing is real. So just make sure the story you're telling is full of your truth and your truth alone. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, another 50 minutes with Alan where we talked about 9-11 as a synchronistic mystery, why sinks may be appearing in popular media, 2001 A Space Odyssey as a massive sink with 9-11, the role of the monolith in that film according to 2001 A False Flag Odyssey, it's a great website, check it out, and we wrapped up on the implications of studying synchronicity and how to incorporate this way of magical thinking into your daily life if you're interested in doing such things. And a shout out to Will for supporting the Patreon campaign recently. Hopefully, Will, you enjoyed this extension. And if you'd like to hear more from Alan and any other guest, patreon.com slash culture is the place to find those extensions. They are embedded into the audio already. Just download the episode. You'll be good to go. But yeah, I got a lot on my plate right now, as some of you may know. New podcast prep. Online classwork has started. Some other writing projects I'm trying to get going. So time is scarce, which means we close the book on yet another episode here. Only five of these things left, but I do hope you come back for each and every one of them. Until next time, though, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh.